What's up, everyone? Welcome and thank you for joining us for our first episode of our new podcast, Science Friction, which focuses on the journey to overcome design challenges. I'm your co-host, Avery Birkins, here with my awesome co-host, Adam Spacht. Hey, Adam. Hey, Avery. Today, we have a great episode to kick things off. We're going to be meeting with Josh Scott of 72 Concepts. They've developed a machine tending device that implements IGUS products to overcome some really interesting challenges. And along the way, we sort of spiral off into industry 4.0 and automation. Uh, but instead of me trying to describe it, let's turn it over to Josh and hear the conversation in motion. The R theta bot was most definitely uh, developed out of out of necessity and then looking at a problem. And you know, you've heard the 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 phrase, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Mm -hmm. uh, we we kind of see the opposite in, in automation. People bring a tank to a knife fight, right? They come in with a, a six axis robotic arm and, you know, all these great degrees of freedom with ultra precision and they can, they can put the part within tenths every time. And the problem is that's way overkill for the, for the process that you're looking at. So, our theta bot was driven out of the necessity to come up with something that was low cost yet still efficient and produced uh, the cycle times that the customer was looking for and could handle the quantity of parts, you know, annually that, that we're looking at. What does the R theta bot do? So it's a machine tending robotic arm. Um, so it, it takes a part that's presented to the machine and it will pick that particular part up uh, typically oh. out of a, a part nest or a dead nest, something that is presented, the part is presented to in a fixed location, the R theta bot will pick that part up and it will present it to a machining chuck or an assembly fixture or some sort of a work holding device. And typically a, our R theta bot will have two, it'll have a flip axis with two grippers and one gripper will grab the finished part and then very quickly flip to a different orientation to load an unmachined or uh, unworked part or present a part for assembly to uh, another part and then get out of the way and go back and, and, and uh, get another part while the operation is going on. So yeah. a typical operation would be present an unmachined, grab a finished machine part and present a machine or an unmachined part to a chuck for that operation. And then while that machining operation is going on, we're going back and getting, dropping the finished part and picking up another one. Did you find that, most of the applications where a product like this would be suitable, there's that sort of normal bell curve where you have the one end of the spectrum where you need micron precision, bazillionths of an inch, you know, repeatable till the end of time. And then there's that big chunk where, you know, listen, we have to have a work product into the chuck, but it doesn't necessarily have to be at this exact reference point in space. Is, is that a pretty big bucket of applications, I'm assuming? Yes, yeah, actually, that's a very good that's a very good uh, analysis. That most of the most of the time when you're presenting a part to uh, a machine, for instance, uh, the work holding is not something that needs to be ultra precise. Um, you know, and and again, you're you're 100 right. If you can, it, we're not going after 100 percent of the applications on 100 percent of the machines. We're not trying to be the, you know, the the answer to everything, right? And and honestly, you know, six axis. Uh, robotic arms are quite versatile right and they can do a lot of those things and as a as a result people tend to lean on them and unfortunately they tend to overpay for what what they're getting right so you can come in with an application that's a little bit uh less precise um certainly just as quick and and have something that is in a price point that's different than something with six degrees or seven degrees of freedom uh, on those arms so that was sort of the niche we're going after is something that, you know, just in, in our, in our estimation, wasn't really existing. Something that had the speed and enough precision to get the job done, but not, not so much that, you know, you had to pay a whole lot extra for it. And Avery and I were talking in the background before we got together. I'm, I'm guessing uh, that when this project started, it was like, oh yeah, this is going to be wonderful. And there was probably a lot of design twists and turns along the way. Uh, I guess first question, is that true? And then second question, where did some of those turns take you that you weren't maybe expecting? Yeah, definitely a lot of twists and turns. Um, you know, 
packaging is always a concern and, and, you know, there's things you take for granted in the conceptual phase and then you get down to the nitty gritty and you find out, well, that's in practice, that's not going to work real well. Um, you know, so early on in the, in the product design phase, you know, we were looking at linear bearings, obviously to change the radial length of the R theta bot. And there were a myriad of different companies out there from roller bearings to, you know, whatnot. And we obviously, that was part of our first introduction with IGIS was some of the offerings that IGIS had on linear bearings. And I think we, I'm going to get the part number wrong. I think we ended up with the RJUM linear bearing. Um, and what we found was those two rods that ride through on the R theta bot um, were a perfect vehicle to actually transmit the wires and the air hoses and get those down to the end effectors without binding the rest of the operation or having to come up with a some sort of external loom that would follow the R theta bot, right? So having, you know, I guess was the only company that we found that actually had hollow linear rails that were precision and we could use in that application. So it, it really was something that I think when we saw that, that, that light went off for us and said, okay, this is going to be something that we can, we can fish sensor wires down through there, airlines for opening and closing grippers um, uh, and, a, and a, a host of other things. So we've got some ideas up our sleeves for future um, iterations where we're going to, you know, possibly do some additional degrees of freedom on our, on our end effectors that, that we can use those same hollow tubes for. I had no idea that that's that I, I would imagine that just so, so simplifies the footprint of the machine. And like you say, now you don't have to do cable management. You don't have snags. You don't have all We still that. have cable management at the far end, but it's not something that we have to, you know, when you're talking about having anything that changes radial distance, that was the challenge, right? Most robotic arms have several linkages that are of fixed distance and they pivot, right? So they, they form a section to get shorter and longer. We truly have a fixed length arm that that changes its position from the center rotation right so as it slides back and forth but of course as you're sliding back and forth there's there's things on the end of that that have to get attached so they can do useful things like give you information back on the sensors and open and close grippers and whatnot so yeah it was a it was a one of those things that it, when, when we saw the application it was hands down we're like okay this is this this is the right answer we can stop looking and go on to designing the next phase. <laughs> and how does using um, those IGIS products make this like a better robot for your customers? Like how does it benefit them in the end? You know, as a, as a mechanical engineer, um, you know, we're exposed to a lot of different things and, you know, we're, we're certainly looking at different applications, but that does not make us an expert by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so having a, a team like IGIS behind the product um, and being able to call up to, to the folks, you know, for instance, in Rhode Island, we, we talked with the folks there and, and they were right away, they could tell us things about product lifecycle, loading, what the best materials were for the application um, and all of that. It's like having a whole other team behind you that, that you're, you know, it just props us up, makes us look better, certainly to our end customer when we can go in and talk with intelligence um, and the first, the first R theta bot that we did, um, you know, was for a pretty high profile customer. And, you know, it was one of those things where they say, okay, well, you know, what, what kind of guarantees do we have that this is, this is going to function and work and it's going to be um, exactly what we need. So at the end of the day, you know, I was able to lean back on and say, look, these are, these are linear, linear bearings from a well-known company we're not reinventing the wheel. These are, these are applications that are uh, other industrial applications. So having that data kind of in our back pocket from IGIS was, you know, was key to having the customer sort of readily accept that and say, okay, yeah, this is, this is something that is, makes a lot of sense. Almost like it makes it more reliable, kind of yeah. like if someone gets this robot, it's like, wow, this is yeah. even better than what I was yeah. expecting. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and there's some advantages to using the, the polymer bearings over uh, some of the, you know, ball bearing uh, systems and the fact that, you know, we, we work in oily uh, chip laden environments and they, they're almost self wiping in most cases and you don't have to worry about all of that debris getting, getting caught in there and actually, 
getting wedged in between ball bearings and things like that. So it, it, it's a, it's really a great application for, for what we're using it for. Is the R Theta bot available now or is it still either like are, a prototype? Or? It is available now. We are working on uh, what we're calling affectionately version 2.0. Um, you know, we've taken some of the limitations. The first iteration of the R Theta bot is actually a, in, in double shear. Uh, it actually pivots between two, uh, I, I say one axle, but on, on two ends. Um, we're working on a, on a version right now that actually uses an IGA slewing bearing that is uh, a singular sided, right? So now we have much more uh, degrees of travel in, in that axis. So that's, uh, that's, our, that's our iteration too that's nearing completion. How's that coming along? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. We've done some some speed tests. Uh, we were able to uh, get some much quicker movements out of the robotic arm, um, and get get some. Uh, it's always it's always about how quick you can go, especially when you're when you're stopping a machine from doing its job, or you're stopping an assembly process to present a part to it. It's get the part in there and then get out of the way and let it go back to doing its its job. So that minimizing that time usually means we've got to do what we need to do as quickly as possible and then get in and get out. So, um, yeah, that's, it's, it's allowing, uh, some of the improvements that we've made are allowing us to do that and do that a little more accurately. Oh, wow. What sort of linear travel speed is that? It just sort of dawned on me. I'm looking at a picture of it over on this screen here. Uh, how fast does that have to move linearly to, to get the speeds that you're looking for? Pretty fast. I mean, we're doing a radial move from end of stroke to end of stroke, uh, basically swinging through that arc. We can swing through that arc and uh, from the end of its travel, and we're talking about a roughly 30 inch long uh, arm. We can do that in uh, less than half a second. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we're accelerating, coming to full speed and then decelerating to a stop in yeah, roughly half a second. I was wondering if there was uh, like an estimated ROI of some sort for the R theta bot, or if that was very just dependent on whichever company is requesting it. Yeah, it, it's, it's very dependent on the application, um, you know, depending on what, what we're doing, if we're replacing a, a person or a salary, in most cases, we're not replacing a person We're we're taking that person and allowing that person to run two or three machines. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we got into automation at the very start of this was our market research showed that in, in the years to come, that there's going to be fewer and fewer people that are doing machine tending. Uh, and it's not from the standpoint of, it's from the standpoint of wanting to do it and, and having the workforce available. And that was reinforced with some of the larger companies that we worked with right out of the gates. Um, they all echoed exactly that. Uh, you know, they were predicting, I, I, I I'm going to get the years mixed up, but something in like 2027 or 2028, 89% of those positions are going to go unfilled. Um, some of the customers that we were working with in 2019 said, we already have 40% of our jobs for machine tending that are going unfilled. So they don't have really any other alternative other than automating those processes. So coming in with any kind of an automated uh, solution, uh, you know, or an R theta bot, you could, you could come in and, and reduce the amount of time that a person stands in front of that machine and allow that person to essentially deliver parts to those machines and maintain those machines and, you know, increase their skill level and their skill set and do a little more technical operation. So, you know, the big misnomer is that, oh, these robots are replacing people and taking jobs. And it, it you know, time and time again over, over history has shown that, it actually increases the, the number of jobs and increases the, you know, the, I guess the, the way of life or work life increases helps, you know, people have a little better quality of life at the job rather than standing there in front of a machine, opening a door, putting a part in, pulling it out, closing the door, you know, it was a repetitive, even there's even companies that aren't worried necessarily about cycle time. They're more worried about, repetitive injury for employees and they'll come in and, and say, okay, we need to look at a, an automation application. You know, and, and again, it, you know, I know I guess has a lot of different applications and different things. I mean, you guys sell some uh, robotic arms as well. Um, some pick and place, some X, Y uh, gantries and things like that. So, I mean, those are all things that we look at when we're trying to come up with a solution to a problem 
you know, we try to have all of those things at our fingertips and say, okay, maybe this is a solution that is better fit for something that exists, you know, for that particular application. I'm kind of awesome. going off on a tangent. I apologize, but I thought that was all really great. Um, Cause that definitely is a big thing when people think of automation, it's like they're taking over the world. We're not going to be needed like that kind of thing. So it's, it's important yeah. to talk about. What we're finding is that the, you know, the, the level of, uh, I guess, skill coming out of high school now and, and computers and programming and things like that, uh, you know, the industry as a whole is shifting away from some of the older architectures of programming and getting into some areas where some of the, the, the newer languages and things are being used in industry as well. So I think that's critical for having success, certainly in the United States, for, for automation is, you know, you're only as good as the people that are, that are creating and, and, and programming it. So, you know, being able to have the younger generations uh, understand it and want to become involved in robotics. And, and a lot of these programs you see now for younger kids, it's, it's something that, you know, it's exciting to see because, you know, that's really, you know, if the U S is going to continue to be competitive in manufacturing, um, you know, people don't want to have salaries cut and work harder and more hours. They, they want to work smarter. So, and I think that's really coming out of school. A lot of these guys can, you know, roll right into it. And, and some of the ladies that are out there learning the stuff as well. So it's, it's, it's exciting. Well, thank you, Josh, uh, for joining us today. We appreciate your time. Much appreciated. Thank you. That was Josh Scott. He's the president of 72 Concepts. Josh and his team can help you with product design, custom engineering solutions, or improving your processes. Contact them online at 72concepts.com. That is numeral 72concepts.com and that web address there. Science Friction is produced by Zach Davis. Eddie Equeo is our sound and video engineer. And Kelsey Mariah Orsman is our graphic designer. I'm your co-host, Avery Brookins, joined by my fabulous co-host, Adam Specht. And thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week.